and welcome to the state of Kerala. It's a great experience to interact with students from across the sea. And uh, thinking about the topic which I will be presenting in a much simplified form than the what I have written over here. I have a full paper with me, but <laughs> I don't think I will be reading out the whole paper for you. The theme which is being titled the Elephant vs. Dragon. I have a little twist to that title. I will be comparing dragon vs. elephant. Mm -hmm. I will be just changing the bit of that. <laughs> so let the dragon be in the front and the elephant comes behind in a slow, slower pace. So this is a small twist which I will be doing it. And that do have my academic background of little bit of knowing. I was studying Chinese studies for a few years and doing some field research in China. China. Paper is uh, looking into the, the, the course as you, you have, the democracy and the modernization process, democratization and modernization process. The paper tried to link this into a single process of the current hot topics like the urbanization, the process of urbanization. Generally, when you think in terms of the urban space, it is immediately coming into our mind that it is the, the economic unit, the urban as an economic unit that is creating that loop or the attraction. But we also knew that many of the political transformation which happened across the world do have the center of urban space. So in in Many, any context or in terms of the political or the economic, the contribution of the urban space is immense. So what I try to do is that bringing in the debates you will be covering as part of your course in terms of the aspect of process of urbanization and comparing the dragon with the elephant in the urbanization process. Let me start by just briefly looking into a history of how urbanization, the process of urbanization happened in China and India. We do have a, two countries do have a, a, a immense history, civilization and past. And urban centers were prominent in these two countries. And prominently, many of these urban centers created products which could be sold to other parts of to Arabia, to Europe, in other parts of the world. And we also created our own routes. The trade by the central government, not the federal government, and 15 centers were identified. And these incubation training, incubation training centers for entrepreneurs to start a tender enterprise, you will be get trained in specific technology. And you will be trained in managing that institution or organization, then you start up the organization. So you will be starting your programs in these institutions, then you will be coming to the field. This is what the incubation role of these incubation uh, centers. Nationally, there is 15 incubation centers which is being created, and people are getting trained, and many of the reputed institutions like in India, Indian Institute of Management, Indian Institute of Technology, IITs and IAMs, they are involved in these training programs. And in Kerala, there is a prominent incubation center. This is in Trivandra. There is this IT park, Techno Park in Trivandra. The, one of the successful incubation parks is in Trivandra in Kerala. So these are, these are the role of the state in assisting or creating new urban centers. The role of the state is not the market which is actually getting the investment over there and making it a, a prosperous urban space. There is the role of the state or the government which assists in creating the urban prosperity. This is very prominently figures in the development strategy of either China or in India. But there is certain differences or in the sense that to what extent the state is involved. There is only the, the, the percentage differences which matters. But generally the state do have this sort of a a, 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 a program. This is what I want to come, uh, what you want to compare in terms of the, the creation of urban centers. 
the last point I will mention is in terms of the social dimension. One is the changing social behavior. I have mentioned about the social stratification, then social alliance I have mentioned. The other is the social behavior in terms of the conception, the increasing conception of the, the urban people. That is what the, the, the China, China, China do had a, a different society till the 80s or 90s. But later on there is this cut, huge change in the conception pattern. This luxury goods, the disposable income is huge, the wealth accumulation is huge. So once that the enormous wealth is being in the hand of one person, the products you buy will also be of that, that enormity. So you need these type of huge products, huge priced products, quality products, luxury products, not the regular day-to-day -day affair, not the that sort of a consumption. So there is this, this shift which is happening in China and India also, but very slowly because the wealth accumulation in the urban centers is not that fast. Hence, the consumption pattern slowly shifting towards the enormity of what the Chinese domestic consumption is. So there is a slow movement towards what is the model or what is the rate of that luxury product consumption in China. But there is a large domestic demand. And mostly at the middle level, rather than the, the, the luxury product or the luxury uh, consumptions, the rate of growth of consumption is more in, in, in uh, urban centers in the middle level. And what is also interesting to note is that when you compare, it's not uh, China and India. It is the rural consumption which is more than the urban consumption in India. By 2012, the rural consumption is much more. This is very different from what the scenario in, in the Chinese situation. China is, the state is involved in creating domestic demand in the interiors and the government policy is working, started to working. But what is interesting to note is that there is already the wealth in the rural region in India. As we don't have that sort of a land reforms as happened in China. So, what is being now there is a, 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 a integrating process of market with the feudal assets which was created in the rural regions in India. And there is a huge demand that feudal assets are well created, the traditional wealth that if you want to name that way. So the market is interested in this feudal wealth created in the, in the past. And what is also interesting is what the, figure, the fact I noted, noted previously, by 2012, it is the rural consumption which overtook the urban consumption in India. And China is striving towards that sort of a figure by pushing the governmental policies, creating demand in the interiors. So this is the consumption difference in the consumption characteristics between India and China. Then another major point is in terms of the social responses. I'm talking about the social so, society elements. How India and China respond to the urbanization process, social responses. There is consent, people given consent to the urbanization process. They welcome the government initiative, which create prosperity. But on the other hand, there is a lot of dissatisfaction as well. The environmental degradation, the corruption, security issues, these type of issues are very common and there is a, a protest which is happening in the urban centers in China as well as in India. <coughs> the nature of this protest is what makes it much more different between while you compare there is a similarity of dissent and consent, element of consent and dissent and thinking in terms of the dissent in China, it is very sporadic. It is not well planned to organize, but there is an issue locally, and this local protest will be addressed if, if at all, if by the local government or the party official at the locality. Otherwise, it, it can get prolonged, and there are places where the protest had happened for months, continuously for months. So, these local protests are there, but it is not anyway organized and it is not well planned 
or it is not in that way targeted against what is generally described in the in the uh, Western literature as against the state, state against the the people. It is a descent which is generally a descent of the governmental program rather than the government itself or against that that sort of a, a differentiation is much analyzed in in, in uh, various uh, protest cases of protest. But in India, these protests are much more organized or vast. As you might have, if a, if you had a, a uh, what is a familiarity with what is happening in India, there was a lot of protests happening in India regarding the security issue, life of a, an individual, life of a woman. These type of issues were prominently discussed, and also related to the the uh, what do you say the corruption issue. You might have heard about the. Uh, month, uh, for months there was protest in Delhi to implement a strong Lokpal bill. Lokpal bill was, is a bill addressing corruption. The demand for a Lokpal bill, strong Lokpal bill. And what is also interesting to note is that this bill getting passed in the parliament, parliament legislates the law, as you know, and political parties need to be providing consent to pass the, getting past this law. Since independence, it is the ninth attempt in India to pass an anti-corruption law. It is not getting passed. It is the ninth attempt and it is not getting passed. You can see the political dynamics. A strong anti-corruption law is not yet getting passed in India. So the extent or intrusion of corruption into the political decision makers or the social hierarchies, these are very very much there. So nobody wants corruption to be removed and there. Everyone wants the share of that corruption. So hence, nobody wants a strong anti-corruption law which can create a situation where me, myself, legislating a law against me. No, that's, that's not a possibility. So this is happening. This protest local bill, as you might have heard about Anna Hasare, a social activist, a Gandhi, he was involved in mobilizing the urban middle class. So these urban centers were seen as the these urban centers seen this anti-corruption protest in India as well. And what is the next stage? This is here the differences between the Chinese scenario and the Indian scenario is there is the formation of the political party from these social protests. It was sporadic, there was social networking. It created a huge social mobilization, but it doesn't dissolve as it is. What has happened in China, what happening in China is that this once mobilized, it has to get dispersed. You cannot get organized. There is the state monitoring the social relationship. So getting organized in the context of dissent or oppositional views against the government is not acceptable in the context of Chinese scenario. Individual protest do happen, but an organized protest. But in India, these social protests which I have mentioned, anti-corruption demand for a strong anti-corruption law, this social protest has converted itself into a new political party. It is called Aam Admi Party. So this social mobilization getting converted into a political formation is an urban experience in that sense in India. But this is not happening in the Chinese scenario. So these are the, the various dynamics, the political, economic and the social dynamics in which the process of urbanization need to be discussed comparing the Indian context and the Chinese context. What I have pointed out is that, that initially I will just briefly, you might have lost the earlier points, so I will just briefly recap what I have told. The historical experience where there is this comparison which was happening between the Indian and Chinese context how the historical experience created the urban, urban centers in India and China. Then the similarities in the contemporary urbanization processes, the political, as I have mentioned in terms of the, pol the policy making and other, the state interventions and the economic context where the, the capital flight, role of the labor and role of the new technology, 
where these economic attributes is very well reflected. And the third point which I have mentioned is in terms of the social attributes which influence the organization process where the social alliances, social stratification, and the formation of social mobilization into the political formation, these type of things are happening comparing the context of India and China. So it's a huge effort if you want to understand the urban experience comparing two large countries. But these are all initial observations. One has to continuously follow what is happening, what are the first turns, developments which are happening. And one of the recent reports is that in China there was this infrastructure program related to the railways. Huge railway network is being built, high speed railway. And there was this one, I wanted to travel in that, that Tibet <laughs> rail, uh, there was a uh, railway track being developed towards the Tibet, leading in the newer areas. So the railway networks is being developed enormously in the recent, in the recent period in China. And there was this uh, railway ministry, separate railway ministry being created in the in the political decision making. And we also have in India different railway ministry, and we have a different budget. There is this budget annual budget being presented overall for the economy, one budget, and there is initially comes before this general budget, there is this railway budget being presented. So it is very huge for India. There is a separate budget for railways. And the recent reports is that the railway ministry was involved in huge corruption scandals in China. And the recent decision is to dissolve this ministry and link it with the general transportation ministry. This is very much possible in China. The, the extent of drastic decisions being taken or whatever being the, the way in which the state operates, then think about the Indian situation. There is a ministry, railway ministry, and we have coalition partners ruling. Congress is the main party, and previously it was the Trinamool Congress, a small party from Belga, which was a partner of this main Congress party. So the railway ministry was under them. So if there is a corruption issue in this railway ministry, and if the main party wanted to punish this coalition partner, then this coalition partner will withdraw the support then the government will fall. So it's not pol politically not possible. And there is other side. There is this railway ministry and the bureaucracy, huge bureaucracy. Officials, government officials. They will never allow this sort of institutional mergers because their interests, their positions, these are huge. So it's not actually possible to make such a decision as happened in China. If there is some issue, to address this issue, there are various ways or means. And one way is that what happened in India is that this Trinamool Congress state has uh, separated them from the coalition partnership and Congress had taken up the railway ministry. This is happened in, in the politics. It's, it's this political process has happened in India if something happens there. But the way in which state operates in China, that dissolving the ministry itself, that's not a possibility in India. I will end up with that sort of comparison and I wish you all the, and the later tour programs and experience in other parts of India or other parts of the world. Let all the knowledge be yours and experience the world. Thank you.